Let's now look at this idea of odds and odds ratio. If you have an event that has probability of success as p, then probability of failure is 1 minus p. The ratio p over 1 minus p is defined as the odds ratio. This tells us how much more likely the event is to occur, in other words, how much more likely success is compared with failure. Now, there are various advantages of this we'll see as we go along. The first thing is some examples here for calculations. If the weather forecast says it will rain tomorrow with probability of 0.91, then the odds that it will rain tomorrow is going to be 0.91 over 1 minus 0.91, which is 10.11. In other words, it's 10 times more likely to rain than not rain. Now, odds is, of course, used quite a bit in betting and uh, in games, so you might find the odds for that a horse wins the races, so and so, and likewise for cricket games or whatever else. So, odds is commonly used, but odds in mathematics and statistics here is going to be used for some other purposes, as we'll see. So, this is how odds is actually used. Now, just a table here of conversion to see what's going on here. Of course, you can see that if probability of success is low, then the odds ratio is also quite small. When we get to a half, when we've got even chance, in other words, the probability of failure and success are equal, then the odds is actually equal to 1, and that makes sense. Both equal, in other words, probability of success and probability of failure are the same. And as probability of success increases, the odd becomes bigger and bigger and bigger. This is 0.99, that's 99 there. Of course, if you go a bit higher than that, for the odds here, you'll get a larger number. Of course, if you make the odds equal to 1, then I'm dividing here by 0, which is going to be a very large number indeed. In other words, it goes towards infinity. So a graph here of the odds as far as uh, with respect to probability of success is concerned is, of course, as you go towards 1 over here, then 1 here is a vertical asymptote. This is going to go higher and higher and higher. But you can see what's happening here. The probability of success lies between 0 and 1. But the odds lies between 0 and keeps going forever. Now this is, in other words, the whole real line. Properties of odds, they're saying, is odds, pro probabilities, probabilities lie between 0 and 1. Odds don't. There's no upper bound. They're no negative, but there's no upper bound. If the odds of success is W, then probability of success is actually W over minus W, so omega. So, if I put here omega as odds of success, that's p over 1 minus p. All I'm doing here is, in this equation I'm solving for p, you'll find p is omega over 1 plus omega. And of course you can see here, because omega is a positive number, this probability always will be between 0 and 1. If odds is bigger than 1, that means success is more likely. If odds is less than 1, that means failure is more likely. And of course, as we saw earlier, probability of 0.5 corresponds to odds of 1. Here is this study again of uh, the deaths by cardiovascular disease of American Samoan women here. And so here, the obese women, the odds of a cardiovascular death are, so we're looking at the odds here of cardiovascular death for obese women, so probability in this case of obese women uh, get, uh, suffering or uh, death from cardiac, cardiovascular disease is going to be the number who died over the total of 1 minus that. Now, <coughs> actually, so, yeah. <coughs> so, if you look at this, it won't take you very much more to work it out because 1 minus 16 on 2061 essentially becomes 2045 over 2061. So this becomes 16 over 2061 over this 2045 over this 2061. And after these cancel off, I get my 16 on 2045. The other ways of getting this, of course, I'm looking here at the probability of death over probability of no death. Probability of death is 16 over 2061, as I have over there. And probability of no death is 2045 over 2061, as I have over there. So either way, it still comes to 16 over 2045. Essentially, as you can see very clearly, it's just this number over that number, since this common denominator is in both of them. 
So that's point zero zero seven eight two. Quite small. <clears throat> for normal weight women, it's seven over one zero four four. Point zero zero six seven zero. So I may be interested to see whether there is a difference here between these two. And that's what we did earlier. We were looking in this case earlier. We were looking at probability of death for obese women and for not obese women. And uh, now, we, in that case, we decided that there was not much difference there. We're looking now here at this uh, is a ratio, odds ratio. So, in this case, if I'm looking at, at the odds ratio, I've got the two odds together, 0 0.00782 and 0 0.00670. That is 1.1669. So, that essentially means that obese women, uh, this is 0.1. 669, that's about 17%. Obese women are about 17% more likely to die of heart disease than non-obese women. When well, there's a significant difference, we don't know yet. Certainly, if the two odds are similar, then they're close to one. It's a matter of deciding is this close enough to one or not. And that's another problem altogether. Of course, that will require some kind of hypothesis test we'll look at later. Now, Odds ratios can be calculated very easily, and you'll be able to check that yourself, because uh, if you look at the odds ratio here, of the two numbers, if I look at the ratio of 16 over 2045, divide by 7 over 10044, so 16 over 2045, divide by 7 over 1044, you can see what's happening is, <coughs> all, <coughs> all I've done is, it's 16 times this number over here, divided by the other cross product. So I'm multiplying this across here. The top line is, because I'm looking into the death of obese women with respect to the death of non-obese women, I start from here, it's 16 times this number over here, divided by the other one here. So you can see that how this works out, and that's true in general. So to calculate odds ratio from a 2 by 2 table, all I do is cross multiply A times B divided by C times, A times D divided by C times B. That's my odds ratio, and that's the same calculation I get here as I had before for this sum 1 data. Now the odds ratio is more informative when sample proportions are close to zero, because we know that uh, if it's uh, uh, proportions close to zero, then a small difference means quite a bit there. But odds ratio essentially will not be a problem even when we are at the ends of probabilities, either 0 or 1. And it's usually more constant over levels of confining factors. We f you found this. You find if you look at the odds ratio and how it changes over here, you will find from the graph here, it's quite flat for quite a while, and then suddenly it takes off. It's actually something that we can use for regression analysis. We can't use p-values because, sorry, we can't use probabilities because one of the assumptions of regression is we require the response or at least residuals to be normal. We don't find that with probabilities. But we'll see as we go through this course that when we look at the odds ratio, that's a very easy thing to model as a regression for, for many good reasons. And in, re in retrospective studies, this is the only parameter of, oh, that we can use to compare between two groups. And we'll see what this means as we go through it. The idea here is that for certain types of studies, the odds ratio is the only appropriate measure. So in control of design studies, the investigator has the, uh, the, the uh, luxury of being able to allocate subjects to treatments. So there, what we call prospective studies, where we actually have designed the whole thing, we design the cohorts and we select them and you control them. So you select them to be the two co treatments, if you have two treatments. We select similar cohorts for both of those until we get some particular event of interest. But in retrospective studies, in other words, if we're just collecting data on what has already occurred, so if I'm looking at, say, the Samoan data with heart disease, I'm going to pick those women who are obese and those who are not obese, and then look at those who have heart disease and those who have heart disease. So you see, the problem there is I'm selecting particular people there with particular outcomes that are already there. In that case, the outcome is essentially is death by the cardiovascular disease. So proportions actually don't estimate much in particular. I'm more interested to see what is the situation here as far as the ratio goes, which group is more likely to die of heart disease.
So the estimator that we saw these in the, these in the world the names earlier, the odds estimator is essentially p head over one to p head, and the odds ratio estimator is going to be the ratio of two odds, and we give it the symbol phi over here. And of course, once we get data, we can find the value from the observed values of the data we can put in there, and we can get the observed values of those. Now, the sampling distribution of the odds ratio under some suitable conditions here, then that's the log of phi is approximately normal, where the mean is log of phi. The mean actually is the thing we're trying to estimate anyway. So on average, this will be the value we're trying to estimate. And the variance is a variance of log of phi hat. <clears throat> we call this kind of estimate unbiased. I won't go into the details of this. Uh, we can look at this some other time if you wish, or you can from pick it up from somewhere else. The thing is, as far as log of phi, phi hat is concerned, this is the expression we get. 1 over n1 p1 times 1 minus p1, and 1 over n2 p2 times 1 minus p2. This is what the variance of log of phi comes to. It's not a very difficult calculation, but we won't go into the details. So, once we have the logs of the odds ratio, we can just base the inference on the usual normal distribution. And that makes it quite nice. Now, of course, it's the logs of odds ratio we're looking at, which complicates things a little bit. But we can always scale back. We can always transform back after the inference has been done. In particular, the thing that will concern us is we want to find confidence intervals for odds ratio. So we actually find the confidence intervals for the log odds ratio and then transform that back from the logarithmic scale by taking exponentials of that to the usual odds scale. So that we can do as well, and we'll see how that works as we go through. Simulations here, I'll let you look at the code here, but um, all I'm really doing is here is plotting the uh, distribution of those things. You can see here that uh, the odds ratio on the top here and the logs and odds ratio on the bottom the odds ratio is skewed, you can see lots of things over here, the long tail, but the log is actually fairly symmetric. A bit of a tail here, but nothing serious. It is actually more normal, as you'd expect from what we saw earlier. So the log odds ratio is actually fairly symmetric and close to normal distribution. So coming back to a Simon study in this case here, we can find the probabilities, the, the odds of uh, dying of heart disease when you're obese and not obese. And we can take a look at the ratio as well. Now we know that, of course, if P1 is bigger than P2, then the odds ratio for omega 1 is bigger than that for omega 2. So we expect the ratio to be bigger than 1 as well. So we can look at the calculations. And this is not so difficult. We know the odds ratio here was 1.166, as we saw earlier. Same calculation as before. If you're going to look for equality of two odds, what we need to do is take a look at the log of the odds. So essentially, if you're saying that the odds are equal to 1, in other words, there is no difference, then the log of that ratio is going to be 0. Whereas if the phi or the ratio is bigger than 1, then the log of a number bigger than 1 is bigger than 0. So the, the particular hypothesis here of phi being equal to 1, in other words, of no change or no difference, and phi bigger than 1, in other words, one group has a higher odds than the other one, translates to log of phi is equal to 0, and log of phi is bigger than 0 as the alternative. This is much closer to what we did earlier with linear models. So this is now getting together and getting closer and better for us in one sense. So that's how this works out. Now, if I'm assuming that two of the, the logs are equal, the same idea as before, we still require here to replace the P1 and the P2 heads by the overall proportion, some average proportion of the whole of the pooled proportion. And so that's what we need to do here, which is essentially going to be the total number of successes over the total number of trials, which is 0 0.074. That's our P hat here that goes in there. And so in this case, here are the calculations. All we're doing here is putting sample sizes in there, finding the P hat observed, and finding the standard deviation or standard error using my formula here, and then using the not the normal distribution here to test for the hypothesis. So I'm looking to see whether my probability that the probability of my tested distribution is log phi hat is bigger than one. 
So I'm looking at bigger than 1.66, I think it was 88 or something, that is my observed value here. What did I get? 16688, yes. 89, in fact. So I'm looking at that. And so the p value, of course, is going to be bigger than that. So I'm, I've got one minus there. And that comes to 0.3636, which means since my p value is bigger than 0 0.05, we failed to reject H0. In other words, here we're saying that is the two populations, the obese and non obese population, the probability or the odds of death by heart disease is the same for them. There is no difference there at all. The odds ratio is not different from one. And here is this illustration of the p-value. We've got the normal distribution curve that is the distribution of the log of phi here, log of phi hat, and there is the probability in the end. Confidence interval as before, the same problem arises. I can't use the overall probability here. I'm going to use here the probabilities for each of those populations. And we can calculate the standard error like that. But actually it's simpler. Formula is just 1 over A plus 1 over B plus 1 over C plus 1 over D. So it's just the sum of the reciprocals of each of these numbers in the, in the cells that I've got here. That gives you the standard error after the, taking the square root, the standard error of log of phi hat. So it's much easier to calculate that than by using this particular formula here. So we can do that here. I can find out the standard error from there, and the same thing as before. The standard, the uh, confidence interval for log of phi hat is going to be the observed value in there, plus 1.9.6, or plus or minus 1.96, times the standard error, which I can get from the formula I saw in the last slide. Once I have got that, I can transform that back by taking the exponential of both ends to get me a confidence interval on the scale of the odds ratio. So here are the calculations for that. I have done the calculations for the odds ratio, lower and upper. You can see I can take exponential of this vector and I've got here. So in other words, here I've got my phi hat, 95% confidence interval is going to be 0. 0.479 to three decimal places and 2.845. Now we find that actually one lies in there, and we said earlier by the hypothesis test that the odds ratio is not different from one, and that's not surprising in that case that I find one lies in the confidence interval. So <clears throat> That's just the summary of what we've done here, and you can take a look at uh, more of these examples in the lab sheets or this week, and have some practice with this. There seems to be a lot of material here, but in the, in the face of it, but remember, we aren't interested too much in the mathematics. If you can do things by R and understand what's going on there, that's all we'll be interested in. We'll see you in lectures. Thank you. Bye.